Hello, everybody, and welcome to another BISIM uh, conference session. Today, we're going to talk about terrain. This is the second, uh, the second session uh, in, in a two-day series where uh, we're going to sort of do a bit of a deep dive into VBS Geo and TerraTools. Uh, I'm going to assume that most people here actually were at the presentation yesterday. Yesterday, we spoke about um, TerraTools and VBS Geo at the high level. We also spoke in great detail about the, the world server technology and the VBS world server uh, as well. Um, so today's going to be a deep dive to VBS Geo and, and TerraTools. Uh, and we're also really happy to have here, um, we've got uh, Colin from Lux Carta and Craig from Rycon, who will be uh, presenting uh, towards the end of the session on some of the products that they can offer. Uh, so we're really excited to have them here and thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, so just by way uh, of uh, an agenda, today we're going to cover um, just a quick recap of our current and future terrain products just to kind of recenter us uh, around those before we get into the, the detail. Uh, and then we're going to look at the workflows for creating custom VBS4 terrain. Uh, and by the end of this session, you'll understand when VBS Geo can be used uh, and when or if TerraTools is required. Uh, it was a common question we saw yesterday. Can we do VBS Geo for this? Can we do TerraTools for that? Where, where do they overlap? And we're really going to get into the detail there. And, and Earl's got some fantastic examples that he's going to work through. Uh, we're also going to look at the process for uh, exporting VBS3 terrain to import it into the world server or into VBS4 so you can reuse your VBS3 content in VBS4. We're going to look at how that is done. Uh, and then Lux Carter and Vrykon are also going to uh, present near the end. Uh, so just to, to kick it off, we're going to talk quickly about our, our products and technology again. Uh, this is just a recap of what we described yesterday, but I think it's important. And so BICM offer terrain products, uh, which is built on terrain technology. Uh, and at the moment, we have VBS4. It's, it's going to be released uh, next month, middle of August. And that includes a terrain editing tool called VBS Geo. And VBS Geo is a what you see is what you get terrain editing tool. It's designed to be very easy to use. You shouldn't need to do a training course. It allows you to go in and place down roads and forests and modify height fields. Uh, really quickly and easily, as well as import some basic data types, import some imagery, uh, shape files for roads and buildings, maybe some surface definitions as well. And we're going to look at all that later in this brief. Then we have the VBS World Server. The VBS World Server is a product based upon world server technology that streams terrain data down to VBS4 and VBS Blue IG. It also serves as a uh, a storage location for VBS4 battle spaces, uh, and it's quite an important tool in the in the new in the new VBS4 suite. Then we have TerraTools, which is a very powerful uh, terrain editing application, and we're going to see that a little bit later today. It's really for advanced users. And then we have the customized world server, which is an enterprise world server product for organizations uh, to to host and stream and import various data formats. Uh, and yesterday, we also spoke a bit more about some of the additional products that are coming soon, uh, and I won't cover them again. But the key point is that for this specific talk, we're going to be focusing on VBS Geo and TerraTools and the differences between uh, between the two. Okay, also, um, over to you to take it away. I think we're going to do a deep dive into VBS Geo first, right? Okay, uh, thanks, Pete. Um, so for the first uh, demonstration I'm going to show, this is going to be... Um, about geo editing uh, on, a, on the baseline data as it comes in VBS4. So you get VBS4 and you install it. This is the geo editing mode I'm already in here within VBS4. And we're looking at the, the standard baseline global data that you get uh, from the VBS world server. Um, so we're, we're somewhere here in, in northern, northern Canada. And I'm just going to show how uh, from this baseline terrain data, um, we can just start um, modifying terrain and using the tools that are in Geo to add a, a, an interesting little scene. Uh, I'm just going to do this. This takes about five minutes. And we're going to add a little uh, uh, a little clearing with some, some equipment in it. Um, you can see, um, compared to yesterday, uh, someone mentioned if, uh, asked if there were 3D trees. So I have the 3D trees option switched on now. So yesterday, when I was doing the, the biome tour, um, the, the same model objects, objects were being rendered just as, as uh, polyplanes. Uh, and here you can see that they're actually a fully detailed 3D tree, and we have the option to show them as polyplanes or not uh, at, a, at uh, different distances. 
OK, so here I'm using the, the geo-editing tools. Um, this is the surface editor. I'm placing a, a bare earth terrain area to create my little clearing. Um, after doing that little test patch, I'm using the, the area tool to, uh, to, cut out the, um, to, to cut out a clearing into this uh, terrain area. Uh, now onto the road tool. I'm just going to quickly place a road here. Uh, you can see I'm just creating the, the center line for it, and I'm just going to move a little bit into the forest. Um, I'm not going to create a large road network here, uh, just for a sample. Uh, and you can see actually that the road cut into the hillside there. I I, um, I placed the road across a, a steeper section of hill, and it's cut into it um, uh, because of the uh, the segment that I placed there. If I don't want that to happen, I can go and edit the position of that road uh, very easily. Uh, and I can add uh, additional points along that line to have it um, cut less into the terrain. Uh, so you can see that there. And, and uh, partway along the line, I can grab another point to add more, add, easily add more points to that line that I'm creating. Uh, and so you can see I just have a lot of control over exactly what that road looks like. And very quickly, we have a, a very realistic uh, forest road coming into our clearing. OK, so next we're going to switch to um, placing some objects in this, in this uh, area. So I'm going to switch to the model point tool and searching this uh, fairly vast library of objects. I'm going to select some, some uh, tents and place those quickly. Uh, and then switching to, uh, we have a, a Quonset hut for another, another structure I can place here. Um, and you'll note I can rotate the object here. Um, I'm just holding Alt to do this. Uh, in the release version of Geo, there's going to be tool tips that, that show you exactly what your, your options are for, for modifying and controlling the, uh, the position of the objects. Um, so you'll see little tool tips that explain all of the options and make it make, it'll make it very easy to do. Um, so we're going to add a little bit more detail now, going to uh, find some, some storage containers. You can place these very quickly. Um, and I think what's maybe important to think about with this is while this is, um, so we're making terrain editing easier to do, but that also means that we can uh, allow terrain editing to be done by uh, people that aren't trained on terrain, which uh, obviously that means you can have more people building terrain, but a potential benefit of this is letting people that really have a knowledge of a location build it the way that they know it is. So if someone's just come back from uh, deployment and they know that a certain base is built a certain way and you need to have that instead of translating it through a, a, a terrain construction team uh, that person can jump directly into geo and, and place objects exact, exactly as they're supposed to be so in some sense you can you can sort of leverage that knowledge much more quickly from non-specialist terrain people who are specialists in uh, you know knowing what a, a particular area should look like uh, and because this is all happening uh, from the clients connected to the world server that person can be working on a, a a VBS4 instance at another location uh, and send those changes up to the world server for uh, you know, an, an administrator to manage uh, changes and, and bring those into his, his terrain project. OK, so I'm just uh, placing a little fuel cache here. I don't think they're probably not allowed to do it that way anymore, but uh, that's what it used to look like. <laughs> Uh, we have some uh, some lumber we're just going to place really quickly. Again, we're just sort of intensifying this area to make it look uh, more more believable. Just adding in some of these these props that are available from the from the uh, object library in VBS4. Uh, and last, I'm just going to add a palette. So there's a yeah, there's a bit of an icon loading thing happening, but I know that's the the palettes I need to place. Uh, and we're I'm using a development version of, of Geo here, so things are constantly being improved as we just get towards the uh, the release date. OK, uh, so that's almost enough detail. Uh, I guess uh, last but not least, we have the, uh, the porta potties. I'm going to just place those quickly here, by the, uh, probably by the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, that'll be sort of my, my little uh, scenario complete here. So we have a little bush camp just cut into the terrain. Um, again, this is, we're just using Geo, uh, which is a, an element of VBS4. Um, this is the way VBS4 comes. So you can just install VBS4 and immediately do what I've just done here. Um, so uh, just to explain a little bit about the surface tools, uh, you see a few options here. I'm going to switch to the, the surface tool here. Um, and there's a sort of multi-blend or, or a, a dual surface blending option, which uh, might look a little confusing at first, but I'm just going to show how that actually works. So uh, I'm going to switch to the, uh, to the multiple surfaces. And now what we can do is actually blend uh, like a grass surface, for example, which I'm going to select now with this bare earth or, or barren area surface that I have. 
Um, so that's going to let me place uh, sort of a randomized scattering of grasses. Even though I have one big brush, I can have a, a mix of surfaces. So it lets you get a very realistic looking uh, you know, effect on the terrain that um, otherwise might take a lot of time to paint in all the, all the random scattered detail. Uh, so I'm just going to add a few of those examples here. Um, and you can see there's sort of patches in the, in the grass where there's bare earth and it's sort of blending in uh, pretty well to the rest of the terrain. Yeah, so very quickly we can we can just sort of leverage all of these components that are in VBS4 already and just uh, kind of control where they're appearing and uh, get things looking exactly exactly the way that we need them to. Uh, okay, so we're almost done here, and I'm just going to show an example of just adding another clearing and connecting it with a road. So if we needed a maybe a, a clearing for a, a helipad or something like that, we can as again just very quickly do that with the brush tool. Uh, I'm going to switch back to the roads and add another uh, link between these two two locations so they're connected together. Uh, and that's it. That's just a really quick view of jumping into VBS4 and making an edit on the terrain. This change when I save it will be sent up to the world server and any, anyone else who's connected can grab this information and start their mission on this terrain edit that I've made. So I can provide terrain edits for someone who's, who's building a mission and sort of contribute to their uh, to their work. Okay, so the next thing we're going to show here is the ability of GEO to import um, geospatial data. Um, so this is something if you were watching Pete's uh, VBS tech conference previously, uh, he did show this. Uh, I'm going to show it again because it's an important part of GEO. So this is the second uh, workflow that you might use when you have uh, VBS4. So again, this is just using uh, VBS4 and the VBS world server together, which are, are released together. Um, and what we're going to do is use this, this GEO uh, data import feature, uh, and we're going to go and find some of the data we want to import, in this case, uh, uh, su uh, surface classification. Um, and we're just going to, yeah, we're just going to load this data in here. Uh, and I've actually cut the time. It takes, it only takes a minute or two, but I've just cut it down to, to speed things up. Uh, so you can see that surface data loading in here, and what it's doing is defining where these different biomes should appear. So we now have uh, uh, forest areas appearing where they should based on that, that surface classification. Uh, there's some sort of scattered vegetation being being placed in open areas, uh, and then we have dirt patches and uh, sort of an urban or, or uh, sort of a building classification. So there's you'll see in a moment that there's actually meant to be a building placed there. Uh, and that by itself may be good enough. So you may you may be happy with the, the sort of procedural result uh, using this information. Um, but we can also import uh, real uh, ortho imagery if we want as well. And that's what this stage is going to show. So that's going to import in just a second. Uh, now we have our imagery. So we're looking at um, yeah, our, our fairly high resolution. I think it's one meter resolution imagery. Um, and as we get close to the ground, you'll see that the grasses actually are uh, colored by the, the satellite imagery, and this helps everything blend together. So you don't have a, you know, a, a highly green grass appearing on a on a desaturated uh, satellite texture. So it helps everything blend in really nicely. So you can see there's a, a building position here that isn't placed yet. Uh, we could leave it here and start using Geo to just place uh, objects from the library on these locations to kind of find a best match. Uh, but we also have the option to import uh, building footprints. So this is a shape file. It's vector data that is just a, a two-dimensional polygon. Uh, as it imports into Geo, it's actually going to be created. It's going to generate a 3D building model and place that 3D building model for us right on, on the locations where uh, each polygon was defined. And what you'll see in this version, since this is a few weeks old, is uh, a fairly basic texture appearance of the buildings. Uh, in the release, we're going to have uh, the fully detailed models, as you see in the rest of the, the global data set. So there's going to be uh, window and door textures, uh, you know, correct materials for things to look a lot more realistic. OK, so that's, that's the end of um, that section. So what we've just covered now is uh, right out of the box, two methods of uh, improving your terrain area. So the direct editing with GEO on the baseline terrain and uh, importing uh, basic uh, GIS data with, with GEO right into your project. And then you can start doing addition. Either you can leave it there if you're happy with it or start doing additional GEO edits on top of that, that data later that you've imported. So I'm going to hold that there. And we're going to switch to the next uh, workflow, which is the, and this will be relevant to people who are on or using VBS3 right now. So this is the um, 
the VBS3 to VBS4 terrain conversion uh, capability. So what we've actually done, I'm going to slow this down a little bit. We're actually, so we're in VBS3 right now, and we're selecting the Warminster terrain, which is one of the baseline terrains that you, if you're, if you're a VBS3 user, you may be familiar with. Um, and what we've done is we've, we've taken some Terrasyn technology called Extract, and we've made a plugin for VBS3 that talks to the world server. So you'll see that in just a second. We'll, we'll first, we'll take a look at uh, the terrain, just to re remind everyone what this looks like. Uh, Warminster in the UK. Uh, it's right next to a military facility, and uh, although it's not shown very well here, just pay attention to that, uh, the, uh, the military base on the, on the right of the, your image here. I'm going to focus on, on that area. Uh, so this is the, the extract tool. You can see we've just launched it from the file menu within VBS3. Uh, the extract plugin dialog comes up, and we have options for which sorts of data we want to import, and we're actually going to, I have to keep this going, uh, log into the world server and hit extract, and it's going to send all of this terrain data up to the world server for us and generate a VBS4 terrain. It's probably worthwhile, Earl, just to, taking a step back and um, maybe pause the video there or if you can go mm -hmm. back a little bit. So, yep. so imagine that um, you're a VBS3 user, you now have VBS4. What did you do to get that extract capability into your VBS3, and does it need to be like purchased separately? Oh, sorry. So yes, this is this is part of the VBS4 release. So these um, uh, the plugin for VBS3 will will come with the VBS4 release. So you'll have access to it. So if you're a VBS3 user and you have terrains you want to have appear in VBS4, you'll download VBS4. The plugin is included there. It gets installed to VBS3 for you. Um, you set up the world server, get it running, and then uh, point VBS3 to it when you're in this menu, and it'll it'll do it all for you. Right, so, so you, it literally installs the plugin for you. It finds where VBS3 is installed, installs the plugin, and then magically you'll have that option in VBS3. Is that correct? Exactly, yeah. Right, and the other point that I, I think is worth highlighting too is that this VBS3 to VBS4 terrain conversion requires the VBS world server, um, which isn't a big hassle. We were kind of expecting most people to use the VBS world server. If um, you attended the brief yesterday, I spoke about how the VBS world server is actually optional. If you just want to load terrain data locally on the VBS4 PC, you don't need a VBS world server. But if you want to do, uh, for starters, the VBS3 to VBS4 terrain import, and in fact, if you want to do the, the ortho imagery import and the different import functions into VBS Geo, you will need the VBS world server. So we'll document all this when you do and don't need the VBS world server, but I think it's an important point to highlight. All right. so. Um, We've now exported the VBS3 terrain to the VBS world server, and now, Earl, you are going to show us that in VBS4. Yeah, and I think uh, just to continue on what you were saying, I think it's worth pointing out that when we say VBS world server, as I mentioned yesterday, that can all run on a single machine. You don't have to have a, a server box or specialized hardware for it. It can run on a PC right next to your VBS3 and, and VBS4 licenses all on the same computer if, if you need it to. Um, yeah, so now we're in. Now we're into VBS4, and we're looking at what has uh, appeared for us thanks to the world server uh, sending this data to the to the VBS4 client that's connected, uh, and we're going to drop right down. So one thing you'll notice is the road textures look a little bit off. That's that's already being fixed, and we'll have a much better match for VBS3 terrain. Uh, oh, sorry, VBS3 road textures, uh, but you can see all the geometry and the the information from the VBS3 terrain came through and is looking uh, pretty nice in VBS4. And of course, the benefit here is the terrain no longer ends at the five kilometer mark into nothingness. There's an entire world of terrain out there that you can uh, go off and drive between between uh, locations. And a good question here from David about location of the terrains. Like, how, how is the VBS3 terrain being geolocated in VBS4? Okay, so if uh, so, VBS3 terrains, if you if you uh, if they have geo positioning information in them, which most do, if you built them with uh, any of the terrain tools, uh, they'll have a geo position, and that's what we use. If it's a geotypical terrain, um, even those, at least on the VBS3 side, will have been given some fake coordinates, and they'll appear at that location, which means if you want to change its location, you can just update the config for that VBS3 terrain um, and uh, specify its location. Uh, and we're actually just about to look at that. So this is an example uh, I'm going to show Sarani in, in VBS4. So, so while you're doing that, just kind of like, just because I'm, I'm curious myself, yeah, what would happen Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just going to get it up. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. So, so um, I'm certainly curious about, so, so you can take a completely fake VBS3 terrain and you can import that and whatever coordinates are specified in the, in the, in the configuration for the VBS3 terrain, that's where it'll appear. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm putting a tropical island in the middle of Africa, you know, it's going to appear there. Is that correct? 
It will, yeah. So that, that brings some problems, like if it's a really high elevation inset in Afghanistan and you, and you try to put it uh, in the Netherlands, you're going to have a, a terrain spike there. So you, that stuff can be modified on the VBS3 side before you import it. Right. Um, so there, there will be some ways to do it. And there's also um, uh, some some terrain blending technology that we're, we're doing so that the, the edges of the terrain will, will be smoothly blended in. So if you're only off by a couple of meters, it won't look like a uh, you know, a sharp wall between the, the elevation changes. And of course, you can always look at that terrain in geo after and then smooth things out manually in geo. Right. And so, I mean, this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, but you know, if I've configured my VBS3 terrain correctly, it's geo reference, the altitude is set correctly, then there's nothing else to do, right? Right. And yeah. that, that's what we saw in Warminster. So it was, it is exactly in the place where it, need, where it needs to be. Um, and it did that fully automatically because the, the data was there correctly in VBS3. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so now actually what we're looking at is Sahrani. So, so VBS3 users will be very familiar with this, uh, this terrain. Um, we've located it. It actually has the same geo geolocation as it did in VBS3, which is a, a fake location in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, you just didn't know that because the rest of the world wasn't there in VBS3. Um, so it's, a, it's basically a 100% replica. Uh, everything that you know from Sahrani is there, um, and it's... Uh, yeah, we, we've imported it into VBS4. So I think the other thing to mention here is there, the VBS4 team is working on a mission converter as well. So if you have a lot of missions you've built around Sarani uh, and you want to bring those in as well, so now we have the terrain, you just have to import your missions in, in a similar method to what I showed for the, the VBS3 terrain import. You'll be able to translate your missions over uh, to VBS4 as well. And if for some reason you didn't want this terrain, if you had a mission that had to happen at this location in the, in the Atlantic, it's an inset. You can remove the data from the world server and the, and the terrain will disappear. OK, so um, yeah, that's uh, Sarani. And you can see uh, basically all the details from the, from the train are, are replicated here in VBS4. Um, so now we're going to move out of the, I guess these are, so now we've, we've seen sort of the, the um, Three standard methods of dealing with uh, terrain, ter or, or yeah, terrain workflows in in VBS4 out of the box. So there is the direct editing of geo, there is uh, geo importing geospatial data for a small terrain inset, and then potentially editing on top of that. Uh, there's the VBS3 to VBS4 terrain conversion tool where you can take your VBS3 terrains, load them in VBS3, and have them automatically sent to the world server and built in VBS4 uh, for you, uh, and then you can still edit. On top of those, using Geo, Geo as well. So if you if your terrain isn't uh, isn't perfect and you want to make changes, of course you you have the option to do that uh, with Geo after you've imported your terrain to VBS4. Uh, now we're going to switch to looking at some things we can do with Terra tools that go a little bit beyond what we've we've just looked at. So I'm going to switch to a demonstration here showing North Korea. So I'm going to just hold this for a second. Um, so there's a few different things going on here. Uh, first of all, this, this inset will have been built with Terra tools, um, and it includes some of the Lux Carta data that Colin will be talking about later. Uh, so they've just released their Bright Earth suite of products, and one of the things that uh, we find really interesting from that is their land use and land class data that they're generating automatically from, uh, from Sentinel data. So it's 10 meter resolution data, and they've provided a sample of that over all of North Korea. So it's, I think, five or six geotiles, uh, and we're gonna drop down now to uh, closer to the train so we can take a look at that. Um, so I've left a, a kind of a, a harsh boundary here so we can actually see the difference between the standard default terrain that comes with VBS4 uh, and the improved data that comes uh, as a result of, of including that Bright Earth land class data. So um, as I go further into the mountains, you'll see that the the baseline data really isn't that bad. You can see there's there's forest information on the hilltops where it's supposed to be. Uh, there's some field information where it's, uh, or the you know, grasslands and, and forests. So it's not terrible. It still makes a realistic scene, but it's clearly not as detailed as the, the 10 meter resolution data that we can get from, uh, from the improved data import, um, from the uh, yeah, Lux Carta data. So that's over all of North Korea. So it's giving us very accurate positions of forests and, and farmlands. And it's, it's at a resolution where you can really see the, the sort of man-made features like, like farmlands and, and forest clearings, uh, cities, and, and details like that. Um, so there's, yeah, as we get in closer to the terrain now, we've built a, a higher resolution inset in the area of uh, Wonsan, uh, which is, I guess, significant because it's a, a site where a number of uh, rocket launches have happened uh, that went over Japan and, and Guam. Um, so I'm going to hold right here, 
And what you see here, first of all, is the um, the runway. Uh, and this this runway was built in TerraTools. We have a new tool in TerraTools for generating uh, airfields procedurally. So the, the underlying data that created this is just a center line, just one line with some information about the types of markings and uh, and lighting and other information that would appear with the runway. And TerraTools takes care of generating gener generating all of the, the features and the markings that go along with that. So it's a single line going into TerraTools and it comes out as this uh, more detailed airfield. Uh, and I think what's important there is uh, recognizing that when it's in TerraTools, it's in an agnostic format. We can export that to a a high resolution sort of synthetic ortho image. We can export it to an FBX model, uh, to a VBS3 terrain, um, and in this case to VBS4. And I think one of the real advantages of having this in VBS4 as we're gonna look at here, um, if you remember, I was talking about a lot about the plugin system yesterday uh, and what you're going to see happening here, if I just pause it for a second. Um, the data is actually stored as a, as a simple, it's a 3D model, it's, it's a 2D information, but stored as a 3D model with some repeating textures. So the overall file size of this is about, uh, I think it's uh, two or three megabytes. Um, and the blue plugin system takes care of uh, actually rendering that out to a raster image. So, so even though it's polygonal data, the way we store it out of TerraTools, when, when blue and when VBS4 and the VBS world server have the data, what it's actually doing is rendering a raster for me as I need it on camera. So you'll see in a second that I can just keep zooming in to higher and higher detail. Uh, and sort of no matter how much I zoom in, I have a really clean high resolution texture provided, even with, uh, with really you know, detailed uh, you know, paint versus asphalt type markings. Um, so that's one of the ways that our procedural system is really efficient with data. So we can, we can create a lot of visual quality with a very small footprint of data. Uh, the camera just jumped there, but let me come back to the, to the airfield. Um, so that's in TerraTools right now. It hasn't been released, but in the, in the upcoming 5.9 release uh, later this summer, uh, this airfield generation tool will be there. And we're also planning to, um, as we develop this tool a little bit more, we're going to move to building, we're currently collecting global data for airfields. And once we have all of that data together, we're going to build uh, every airfield that we can in the world. And, and that can be, become part of the, the VBS world server in the, uh, uh, sometime later this year. Okay, so switching from the airfield to the town itself, um, this is another data set provided by Luxcarta. And what you're actually looking at here is uh, building footprints that they extracted from high resolution imagery for us. Um, so they have uh, the capability for an AI based system to uh, look at high resolution imagery and detect boundaries of, of buildings and, and provide those polygons. Um, I'm gonna actually just pause it here for a second and show what that looks like in TerraTools. I think we're good for time. Um, yeah, so this just takes two minutes. I'm gonna just hold this video here. We're gonna jump into a, a quick look at TerraTools, which our business developers hate, but don't be scared. Um, I'm gonna show a really simple example of um, the LuxCarta data coming into TerraTools. Uh, so you can see here all of the uh, building footprints and vegetation areas uh, all together. And we just do a quick separation between buildings and vegetation. Uh, and then a little bit of standard cleanup and you'll see, I'm gonna open up the, the building layer now. And you can see all of the building footprints that we were able to, uh, to bring in from uh, LuxCarta's process. So now we're gonna jump, uh, one of the problems we have, and, and this is um, a really good example of why you might need TerraTools and uh, uh, to do some advanced operations. So I also have OSM data, and the OSM data in this area, the OpenStreetMap data for building footprints isn't, isn't very complete. Uh, but it does have some good building footprints that I want to keep. So I need to find a way, and the real problem here is that these may overlap with the LuxCarta data, and I would get two or three buildings in the same position if I run these both um, uh, into the system without doing anything about it first. Um, so what we're actually going to do is use one file to mark the other file and then separate the marked results. So you can see there's just a, a simple uh, mark features node, and then we're extracting the data that we don't want, or extracting the data that we do want, and you can see the combination that I'm going to open up here uh, shows both data sets conflated together with no overlaps, and we have a much more complete picture of the world now. Uh, and I did see a question about uh, airfield generation with lights and signs. Uh, yes, we're, we, we support the lights already, and that's, that's going to be part of the, um, there will be sample airfields in, in 20.1 already, VBS4 20.1 that include all the lights. Uh, TerraTools is generating all of the lights, and we're working on the, uh, the signs and the other sort of structural features around the airfield now. 
Um, sorry, just to get back to the uh, so the building generation here, I think we just finished looking at the, the conflated data that has a more uh, complete city. Uh, and we also have roads here. Um, the baseline data in VBS4 does include all of the OSM roads already, uh, but you can turn that off. And in this case, I've turned it, turned it off just to show how TerraTools can import uh, its own road data and put that into VBS4 for you, which gives you control over, uh, you know, adding or removing roads, or just if you have a different data set than OSM, you can you can use that data as well uh, very easily. Um, so this is the final stage of uh, the, the cultural features before they go to the uh, to the VBS World server. There's, there's points for every building model that we generated. Uh, all the linears for the roads are here, uh, and that goes off through our exporter to, to VBS4. Uh, just to show that quickly, you can see uh, it's relatively simple. You just choose the ver version that you're exporting to, uh, and it takes just a couple of minutes to build. And I think it's worthwhile. So, so what you've created here is a inset using TerraTools. This could be loaded onto the VBS World server or directly into VBS4 or VBS Blue IG. Is that what you're showing? Yep, exactly. Yeah, right. And so, yeah, it's a really good example, I think, of VBS Geo versus TerraTools, right? So an advanced user would use TerraTools, kind of build out this big, um, this big area based upon these real world data sources and, and modify large amounts of data really quickly. Uh, and now I think, Earl, you're gonna go in and use VBS Geo just to modify a small area, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So this is the TerraTools result, basically a first pass to see if I, if I like the, uh, how things look. Uh, and you'll notice that um, even though the, I, I didn't go into detail in this in TerraTools because it, uh, it can get a little, uh, maybe too much detail for this, this call, but um, all of those building footprints just had the boundaries. They didn't have any information about roof type or uh, uh, building textures or anything. So we used a script to just automatically and randomly place that. Uh, but it's sort of a, it's a, smart, a smarter system that can um, add taller buildings near the city center and shorter buildings at the edges or based on the, the area of the building, we can influence what kind of buildings should appear. So you can see that here, there's these uh, you know, sort of dense little sections of, of city on the outskirts or buildings on the outskirts and some taller, larger buildings with uh, you know more suitable uh, office or, or residential building textures on them. Uh, we can get more sophisticated with the textures. Uh, as I mentioned, this was a really quick pass. We uh, didn't spend very much time on this, but uh, it's once you have all of your textures set up and, and the, the I guess the, the styling that you want, it's very easy to, to scale this up to very large areas. Can, can you just pause? Just I, I've got a couple more questions for you just to yep. Um, yep. draw out what you're doing. So, so what about like in terms of time, right? So, you know, let's assume that we want to do some training for the guys in our battle simulation center uh, in Wonsan, uh, and you've got maybe a set of these data products. You know, how, how long does it take to do what you've done here? Was this a week or two? Was this a day or two? What, 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 maybe just talk about the process you went through to kind of create this really nice looking area of North Korea. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's a couple of answers to that. And the reason is, um, so so North Korea is a train that I haven't built before. So we don't have um, you know a, a set of North Korean sort of appropriate textures. So initially uh, I took a little bit of time trying to sort of select some textures that I wanted to use. Um, and that sort of process of defining the the styling that you want to use can take a little bit of time in the in, in the you know a day or two, um, as you sort of test the results and see if you like how the the textures are working. Uh, but once that's built, then it can be very quickly to reuse that in the future. And actually, what ended up happening uh, and was sort of uh, a really good coincidence is uh, our office in in South Korea was also building some area of North Korea, and they actually spent the time to build out. You can see the the textures with the the uh, sort of um, mint colored roof there, they actually had that built already. So I was able to just take that and use it and it saved a lot of time for me. So I kind of spent a little bit of time looking at ways I might sort of build the, the styling that I wanted. They already had it. It's very easy to use that. That becomes part of TerraTools that all TerraTools users can then can then use. So if you, if you guys are going to build anything in North Korea now, you can borrow these uh, definitions that we've created very easily and just plug them into your building set. So if if you get uh, Lux Carta building data and you want to have exactly this type of result or improve upon it, you can just take what we built and use that as a template. So it sort of gets faster and faster as you build more of the, the styling information that you want to use. And that's that's where TerraTools can get very powerful. And then so once you did that initial texture work, how right. long then to build? I mean, you're obviously an advanced user, but that's totally fine because there are many advanced users out there. How long did it take you in TerraTools to build um, 
so so altogether, because it was sort of scattered at, at different times, it's it's a matter of hours, uh, probably not days. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, awesome. And and let's imagine that you are, you know, I was about to, someone just asked the exact question I'm going to ask, which is, let's imagine that I'm in a battle sim center, I don't have terror tools, I just have geo. Are there any hard limits? I mean, if I had the building shape files um, for the entirety of this town, and I have maybe ortho imagery, you know, could, could I build this whole thing in VBS geo? So, so you could. Uh, what would happen is uh, you don't have as much control over the styling. So the the underlying styling that exists in the the VBS four system, which is really good, is, is you know creates nice looking buildings. Uh, you just don't have the control to go back and change like the building height styles and and other things like that. Um, uh, so so when you at least in the twenty point one release. So when you import uh, data in Geo, you just provide it with the footprints, and it'll do uh, things according to its predefined uh, generation system. And in terms of scale. Uh, an area like this, I can actually test it and, and follow up after, but it should be uh, tens of minutes, uh, probably not an hour, uh, or, or probably not anywhere close to an hour, uh, maybe five, 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 five to 10 minutes to, to, to import the data in the same way that we saw the, the demo for that Fort Carson, Colorado area previously. OK, awesome. Thanks, man. Um, and of course, the, the one example I was showing in Terra Tools is if you use a data set like that, um, you can't import two data sets on top of each other. There's just, at, at least in the 20.1 version right now, so we don't have those um, conflation tools uh, set up. So you would pick either OSM or this other data set. Uh, it's just a um, currently a very simple import tool. Understood. OK, so this is, um, I think here we get into uh, something that I find pretty interesting. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about, should I use Geo or should I use Terra tools or what's the boundary between the two? And, and we're finding that it's actually really, really useful to, if you're a Terra tools user, to have access to Geo to do things like I'm doing right now on screen. So um, in Terra tools, uh, choose, you know, imagining what the terrain's going to look like and trying to um, make all the best selections of textures and road styles up front is really difficult. So instead of worrying about that, we can just build the terrain really quickly using whatever default sample styles we have available quickly, see what the train looks like, and then come into VBS4 with Geo and start modifying some of the styles and seeing um, what actually works better, and then go back to Terra Tools and apply those changes. Uh, so what I'm doing right now is just changing the road style. You can see, actually, there's a bit of an issue I have to clean up in Terra Tools where these roads are, are segmented into small pieces. Uh, they should actually be joined, and then it would be much easier to, to modify in Geo. That's a, a simple fix I would have to do. Um, so this, this road texture looks a lot better, and it's probably one I should use for most of the city. So there's a piece of information I could just take back and modify one line in a script and have a different uh, road texture appearing in, in the next build. Uh, but there's there's sort of two decision points here, too. You, you may not have to go back to Terra Tools. If you want to just do this editing right in Geo and save this as your battle space, uh, you can do that as well. So what I'm about to do here takes about, I think, five minutes. Uh, so you could imagine doing a few city blocks in less than an hour. That may be fine, and and then you can just save that version of the of the terrain and build your missions on that. And the nice thing about that, again, is someone you may have someone trained who's using Terra Tools and doing the, the sort of heavy lifting. And then you can send that terrain onto the world server to have multiple people connect to it and look at it and make improvements in different areas. Uh, so you can sort of distribute the, the terrain building to people who aren't as uh, maybe don't have all the, the terrain editing skills that you need for Terra Tools, but can certainly use Geo and make uh, make improvements to the terrain. Uh, so now what I'm showing is just trying to find uh, uh, an improved uh, surface texture to use for this kind of um, boulevard area. Uh, and you can see this uh, sort of cobblestone looks a little bit better than the kind of generic urban area surface that's there. So I'm going to use the area tool to uh, fill that out uh, more quickly than the paintbrush tool. I'll just do this to, to both sides of the road. Uh, I may advance this a little bit or speed up the time so we don't need to see all this. OK. All right, so I'm, I've, I found a texture that I like. I'm applying it here on a larger scale. Again, we could go back to Terra Tools and change the surface mapping so that whenever we see urban area, we use this area instead, or some more complex rules like within 10 meters of every road create this type of surface. Um, so we have a lot of flexibility to automate this stuff in Terra Tools after we learn what works well in, in Geo. OK, so now we're in the, the object placement mode. Um, and you can see I I tried one object that I didn't like. You can just simply like hold it in the 3D view to see if it looks good. Uh, you don't have to place it down. You can very quickly switch to another object. And I'm going to place these street lamps along the road. Again, this is something that is practical to do in Geo. We even have the, the linear object placer if I want to do it that way. 
Uh, I'm just trying to do a small sample road, so I, I didn't use that. Um, but again, if this is something, I, if this is a pattern that I like, uh, moving this into Terra tools and doing it on a larger scale is is uh, very easy to do. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in this. Uh, I place a bunch of park benches now, so you can kind of get the idea. I'm just sort of adding a bunch of detail to the to the terrain to see if I, I like if uh, you know what it might look like to have a little bit more uh, noise uh, and things like bus stops being placed here. Um, and again. Um, well, I think I've, I've said it already, but you may just stop your editing or, or complete your editing in Geo and be happy with this. If you like these styles, there are ways to replicate that in Terra Tools and do it on a, on a much larger scale. And even though uh, what we might, the value of doing it in Terra Tools later is even though you may be able to do it for this this city in, in North Korea with Geo, um, bringing these changes into Terra Tools and doing it on a larger scale means you can repeat it across every city in North Korea and then have the same uh, kind of improved style everywhere. Um, and let me just place some bollards here. I ended up placing it wrong and it takes me a minute to, to fix what I did. But uh, so you can see we're getting a much more detailed uh, street view. I don't know what North Korea is really supposed to look like. And I'm not an urban planner, as you can see. Uh, and I probably don't have Pepsi vending machines, but uh, we're going to place one anyway. OK, so that's kind of as far as I go with this. It's just sort of a quick test to see if I can uh, add some more detail and, and see what uh, what looks good or, or what sort of objects work. Uh, and actually, another point that is a little bit hard to see if I go back to the object placement tool. Um, so, so one of the, the neat tools in here that I think people struggle with a lot on, on in the Terra tool side is when you're placing an object in Geo, there's a little link you can click. And I'm sorry, I don't have the, the part of the UI that shows that. But you can very quickly copy the object name. Uh, which is the key to placing objects in Terra tools. So if I like that white van that I have selected, I can very quickly get the exact model name of that in BBS, bring it into Terra tools, and add it to my uh, object placement so that I get that exact model uh, where I need where I need it to be. Okay, so that's actually the the end of this little demo. Um, hopefully, you get an idea of where Terra tools is useful and where Geo is useful. There is a lot of overlap, and I think. There's definitely going to be different people that prefer to do, uh, you know, larger scale things in Geo, and other people that still prefer to do small scale things even in Terra Tools because the, the set of tools just just work for their their method of building terrain. Um, but uh, I guess at this point, I'm gonna we're gonna stop this part of the demo. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Colin. So Colin, if you can turn on your webcam, I'll, I'll get mine on as well here. Uh, Colin Irwin from Luxcarta. He's the head of marketing, and he's going to talk a little bit about the data that was provided to us uh, that helped us build this terrain. Uh, so I'm going to turn off this video, and you have the, the floor, Colin. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Earl. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, I'd, I'd like to start off by just explaining what Luxcarta does. Uh, Earl's been describing it, but, uh, but we are focused on remote sensing and production of geospatial data. Uh, earlier this week, we officially launched our our uh, Bright Earth product suite. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and it, it's something that we're, we're pretty excited about. It's global products, and we believe it's an ideal input into uh, what Earl's been showing earlier today here. So that's what I would like to talk to you today about. Now, I'm just going to try and make sure that my slides actually are sharing. There we are. All right. So uh, just a, a brief background about Luxcarta be, before I get into the, the nuts and bolts of the presentation. Uh, we have a, a long history in, in developing and creating uh, digital maps. Our, our core market is wireless network planning. Our products are used by RF engineers to deploy wireless networks and optimize wireless networks. Uh, as a result, we have really long and established relationships with all the commercial imagery vendors. Uh, and recently, we've been heavily investing in R&D in the field of computer vision to uh, to automate what has has have been uh, uh, often manual, very manual uh, production processes through the years. We are a global company uh, with five corporate offices around the world, headquartered in the south of France, not the worst place in the world to be, and uh, and we are expanding. The last few years, we've expanding into the uh, simulation and training space, and uh, and really like the response we're getting here. So, Bright Earth. What is Bright Earth? Uh, there's two core themes here uh, for, for all the products in Bright Earth, and that is uh, the use of AI to generate the products and, uh, and the actual uh, building of the products in the cloud and their distribution via the cloud. Uh, that 
that is going to be a little later stage that we're going to start getting into in Q4 this year. But uh, but the imagery mosaic, we have a, a global image uh, mosaic at 10 meters, as, as Earl mentioned, based on Sentinel imagery uh, that, that we can deliver a global product today. Uh, we are building a, a corresponding 10 class uh, land use land cover. Uh, we could do a lot more than 10 classes if we were manually producing the data. We have about uh, like 23 classes that we use in Telco. Uh, our R&D team is working on automating and adding to those classes. So it's 10 classes uh, and, and we'll probably be live by the end of the year. Uh, but uh, my expectation is that we'll be constantly adding classes into that. Uh, the blue bubbles here on the uh, Bright Earth uh, product line uh, relate to products that are they're going to come further down the line. The, there's some digital elevation models that we're working on, uh, time of day population maps as well, and then a product that uh, that actually helped, uh, Earl was using in in, in that Wonsan uh, uh, building extraction exercise. Um, a product I'm pretty excited about, and I've got a slide in in a minute or two to talk about that a little bit more. So as I mentioned, our uh, our focus is 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 generating data and but but automating our production processes. Um, the video on this on this slide doesn't work, but if it did, uh, at the left of the arrow, you would see multiple Sentinel images in an AWS bucket showing various levels of cloud. And uh, our algorithms basically take the latest and best version of of uh, the image for a certain area, and then they stitch it together using now automated processes that we've been honing for years to build a, a beautiful, uh, you know, color balanced product uh, that's true to life for the entire world. And again, it's at 10 meter resolution. The version of the product that we have now is 80% based on uh, 2019, 2020 uh, imagery from Sentinel, but that that will, those vintages will, uh, will hopefully go up. Uh, other than in some of the stubborn areas around the uh, the equator where cloud-free imagery can be uh, problematic at times. Now, this slide actually shows that building extraction tool. So, so this is actually the GUI that Earl used. This is a prototype. It's actually based on, on, an, on a, a product that we use internally to create our, our products. Um, but it, it, for me, it's a, it's a bit of a game changer because it will let customers that have some meter imagery uh, Actually, be able to derive products from that that submeter imagery, and uh, and as Earl mentioned, you know the building extraction happens. It's uh, it's not perfect, um, you know, and and the goal here is not to have necessarily a perfect product, but it uh, um, we'll get it as good as we can. And and we've had a lot of people looking at it and a lot of interest in it. And uh, and I should also mention uh, there's there's uh, tree polygons here as well. Uh, this was a requirement for, for 5G for the millimeter waves. They wanted to know the placement of all the trees. So, so this takes, you know, what, what could be a geotypical terrain and allows you to take some, some uh, you know, some meter imagery that you've already invested in and add geospecific uh, capabilities and geospecific uh, detail to that. And then in VBS4, you can use the, uh, you know, the procedural uh, engine to actually generate the buildings as, as Earl showed earlier. So, Bright Earth. Uh, I've spent a lot of effort on this uh, product in the last few months, and uh, and I'm glad it's it's finally coming to fruition and coming out into the light, so to speak. Um, the I think the biggest the biggest advantage for for users like yourself that are are looking to move to VBS four is if you if you need to operate in multiple environments to have a consistent product that you can apply and and have a a production pipeline that's consistent and ready to use. Uh, as I mentioned, adding geo-specific reality into your uh, into your terrains uh, simply, and some of the innovative business models. The the building extraction tool is one example. But uh, when we push the products online, you'll you'll be able to actually purchase products via uh, the region level, global level, or or at a geo sale level if if that's all you're interested in. And final bullet here is a discussion about cloud integration. I mean that's a, a a milestone for the product is that it will be uh, built in the cloud and delivered that way, but uh, but we also can can integrate it depending on 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 what your implementation is within with uh, with your VBS uh, implementation. So so we've actually done this with with Earl and his team at, at trade shows. We've streamed data uh, at ITSEC last year where we 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 streamed data overnight. We figured out 
a customer demo in the morning and the next morning we were streaming something that was very relevant to the prospect uh, using WMS and WFS. So that, that we know works, we've already done it. Uh, but if a customer is more interested in uh, and maybe as a, a very good TerraTools users and just wants certain data layers, we, we can provide that as separate files as well. So, so there's flexibility in, in what we can deliver as well. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna show uh, a quick video of um, Pyongyang in North Korea again. So I'm just gonna take this over and we're gonna take a look at uh, Pyongyang where we have some, uh, some of Vrycon's uh, 3D terrain data. Uh, so I'm going to let uh, Craig from Vrycon explain a little bit more about what they do. Um, but here's a, just a quick example to show, um, you know, the ability to get uh, 3D terrain mesh uh, from a, a denied area like uh, Pyongyang in North Korea. So as I get closer, you'll see that these are actually, uh, I guess, hi highly accurate uh, three, 3D buildings uh, in, in North Korea. Uh, generated from a photogrammetry process. And I guess I don't need to explain more about what Vrycon's about to explain to you, uh, but I'm just here showing that it's in VBS4. Uh, we can use it as a, as a data layer. Uh, we're using, in this case, TerraTools to uh, convert this, uh, but in the near future, we will be developing a more native uh, way to ingest this type of data uh, because it is the, uh, the data format being used by the US Army's One World Terrain System. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a good idea of how this can look in VBS4. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask Craig to switch on his video. I'm going to pause this. Yeah. To Craig Brower from Vrycon. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me start out. I'm going to kick off a video. And while it's playing, I'll give you kind of the brief background of who Vrycon is and what we're doing. And then, oh, i got to get rid of sound. Oh, thank you. Did it for me there. So um, if you're not familiar with Brightcon, we're off uh, on a mission to build the entire planet, uh, the highest resolution, most accurate version of the planet. Um, and we're building the entire world at 50 centimeter resolution or better, uh, and with an accuracy of better than three meters in all directions. Um, if you're not familiar with the company Brightcon, we did just recently get acquired by Maxar Technologies. So they were an investor in us and now a wholly owner or on us completely now. Um, and so I won't go into a lot of detail there, but this, what this video does is kind of illustrate very quickly what we do and at the scale that we do it. So here you're seeing us taking multiple images over some given period of time, in this case over San Francisco. We run them through our algorithms, the AI and ML algorithms in, in our data center. And the very first thing that comes out of that is that fully textured 3D surface model of, of that area. We then run additional algorithms against that 3D surface model with all of the imagery in the, in the stack. And we can then go through and now identify everything in that scene. So here you see the 3D surface model. Here then is that classification layer. So these are buildings, these are trees, these are bridges, roads, et cetera. We then can strip all that out and give you a bare earth, 50 centimeter DTM. Uh, and that's what you're seeing in this part of the picture. And then we can also come back and give you a true ortho. So that's basically taking all of the images, reconsolidating them, looking straight down at Nader and providing that straight down view. And in addition to that, now we can provide you all these objects that we took out earlier as individual 3D objects like buildings and trees. And then coming later this year will actually be those same objects, but with their original textures back on them. Um, so that's really, great because you can now bring all of those parts and pieces that you need into the, uh, the software and then use them as you need to. Now this part of the video also shows how important it is to register other data. And in this case, you're seeing drone collected data. So this is five centimeter 3D data, except it was brought into our data suite and then corrected. So now that it maintains that accuracy of better than three meters in all directions. Um, and then from here, you'll see we're, we're gonna be expanding those algorithms to do all the extraction, to be able to come back and start giving you attributes uh, of even that higher fidelity data. So the same thing we do in our satellite data, we plan to do in the higher fidelity data as it comes into our, our data store. Um, the, other, the last thing here, this video is P3DR. So this is registering of real-time data live. So here you're seeing a drone fly over a given area. On the left side, it's unregistered. On the right side, it's registered in real time. So for an operator in that kind of operational environment, you could actually have your live footage coming in, have it registered and dropped out to you right there in, uh, in real time for operational needs. Um, with that, let me shift and hit a couple of quick charts. 
as I find. Uh, oh, there we go. And I'm going to skip a couple of things because we did the video. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll just give you a quick uh, update of, I mentioned earlier, we're processing the entire planet, so we're building the world on spec. Um, we, again, can build this anywhere on the planet. We don't need ground control to maintain that accuracy. Uh, and then this data is very lightweight and portable, but now for this community, and especially for the simulations, you can get all the respective parts and pieces that you may need uh, in order to meet uh, the mission that, that you have. Um, this just kind of reiterates that. What you see here in the center, that 3D surface model, that's the very first thing that we build. That's what we have a team of analysts that do quality control on that data. And then all the things you see to the right and left, and there's more, more products uh, now that are not shown here, but those are all the derivative products that we make available. So the DSM, the True Ortho, the Point Cloud, the buildings, the bridges, the roads, et cetera. Um, the other nice thing, because they're all extracted from the same original build process, we're able to give you all of those different parts and pieces and they will be perfectly correlated. So if you, in your system, you brought in the bare earth DTM, then you overlaid the true ortho and then you brought the texture buildings on top of that or the vegetation or bridges, those things would all perfectly align uh, and be uh, coordinated there for you. Um, very briefly, um, and uh, I think uh, Earl made mention of it a while ago in the one world terrain, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit more information on that kind of concept and some of the things that are being developed there. Um, that's where we're taking what, we're, what we've been doing as far as building this global scale 3D data at the 50 centimeter resolution, but then we can now bring in and register the even higher fidelity data, bring that down so that you have one solution and, you know, the name, One World Terrain, that allows you everything from that high level overview all the way down to the streets, the, the streets, the doors, the windows, and things like that. Um, we do that through that classification. It was interesting in the presentation earlier to see how uh, you were able to bring in those different classification layers and then have them auto-populate into your environment. Um, this is some good examples of where we are right now. I think we're up to 25 or so different uh, automated classification segments that we can do and provide. Um, and so then this, you know, gives you the roads, uh, the bridges, the trees at different heights, the um, the bare earth, the water, you know, all the different parts and pieces we can do, and again, at massive scale. Um, we, by the way, just to give you an idea, I didn't mention earlier, we're building the planet in one degree by one degree geocells, and on average, every weekend, we produce equivalent sizes of two North Koreas per weekend. So just to give you an idea of the scale and that we're talking about, uh, that this data is available now. Um, this again shows just a recap of some of those products. So here from the classification to where you have all the exact, um, and again, that accuracy is maintained throughout all of this process. So you have that exact information about the classification so that you can then go populate it with your other sources. You also have the DSM, the DTM, and then uh, as I mentioned earlier, coming soon will be the actual texture 3D buildings um, at broad scale as well to do that uh, globally as well. And then uh, wrapping up kind of areas that we've built so far. Again, I mentioned earlier, we're building the entire planet. Uh, it is a big place, takes a little while, but we're getting there. We've got over 21 million square kilometers of this data available right now um, for immediate delivery. And it's not only just the 3D surface model, it's all of those derivative products that I mentioned earlier. And so they're out there and available. And then uh, my last chart is again, just kind of wrapping up who we are building the world uh, 50 centimeter resolution or better. I say or better because we do now and as part of the acquisition from Maxar, um, we have a lot more access now to 30 centimeter data. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with Maxar, they plan to launch a, a, a constellation of 30 centimeter satellites next year. And so as that data becomes online and becomes available, we can then be building at that resolution as well. Um, and so that makes it even higher fidelity and higher quality. Um, and so this just talks about some of those products that are out there and available. And then if you need it, there's some contact information here. And I think I have left us enough time for questions. Back to you, Earl. Thank you very much, Craig. And Earl, I'll get you. We'll wrap up with questions. Yeah. All right. So, um, so that, that that actually concludes the session. Uh, we'll be uploading this on YouTube uh, as well as uh, some, some additional content later today.
Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you very much, Earl, for, for taking us through all that. Uh, just to kind of recap what we saw, uh, you, you really deep dove there into VBS Geo and the different ways that it can bring content into VBS4 uh, from hand editing the terrain and what you see is what you get manner through to importing data formats uh, and then importing a VBS3 terrain into VBS4. Um, I'll just say just a couple more things. Uh, you know, the world server is important for two of the three, uh, so you really do need the world server, the VBS world server there, if you're going to be importing those data formats like uh, geo-referenced imagery or the road data or the building data, uh, you need the world server for that. You also need the world server connected for when you export your VBS3 terrain. The VBS world server, of course, is a free add-on for VBS4. It, it effectively comes for free with the product. You don't have to use it, but yeah, if you wanna use those additional features, um, you're, you're gonna need to install it. We do expect the vast majority of our users to use the, the VBS World Server. We just didn't want to make it mandatory uh, in case you want to use VBS4 the same way you do uh, VBS3. And then we looked at Teratools, and um, the, there is overlap between VBS Geo and Teratools, and I think that's probably obvious. And uh, we are comfortable with that. You know, if you're um, I hate using the word inexperienced, but if you know if you haven't had a lot of experience with GIS tools before, uh, if you're a VBS administrator and you, know, you don't want another tool, then you can do a lot with VBS Geo. We're going to provide on the world server uh, a populated base terrain that includes buildings and roads and good vegetation content like you saw yesterday uh, that you can then go in and modify. Maybe uh, your GIS agencies provide you with some data. You have some GeoTIFF format files, you have some shape files, you want to import that into VBS Geo yourself, you can, you, can, you can do that. And then if you're a more advanced user, then you can use Teratools to, to do that and more. Um, there are no geographical limits on the area that you can edit in VBS Geo. Uh, so it's really up to you what tools you want to use. And I'll just conclude by saying that our intention is to bring more of that Teratools capability into the world server over time. Uh, and indeed, like I described yesterday, there will come a future, hopefully not too distant future, where uh, Teratools is an entirely online experience connected to a world server. And we're porting Teratools capability into the world server all the time in a cloud enabled and containerized way. Um, so that'll bring us to the end. Uh, I'm now going to work through these questions. If you have any other questions, if we're not covering your, your questions today, please contact us. I think sales at bisimulations.com uh, and we'll get answers to you. We can also uh, arrange for uh, demonstrations on specific topics if you need them. We also provide trial software. So if you would like a trial of VBS4 and want to play with VBS Geo, uh, please do get in touch with us. Okay, so we're going to answer these questions. I think we have about 10 here. Um, so it's going to go reasonably quickly, I think. Uh, and, you know, the, fir the first one I'm going to tackle myself, VBS Geo replaces Visitor. And the answer is yes. Visitor 4 is not uh, supported in VBS 4. Uh, VBS Geo does replace it. Uh, and we think that'll be a welcome change for most of our, of our users. If you are in love with Visitor 4, if you are one of the few people that love Visitor 4, then you can still build VBS3 terrain in Visitor 4 and then import that terrain in, into, into VBS4. So you can build your VBS3 terrain the way you do now, and then using the import process that Earl showed very simply, get that VBS3 terrain into VBS4. So um, I think Earl might be cringing, but it's possible, right? Uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> can you can also generate uh, shapefile, you know, building footprints and import those, you know, through the geodata import tool. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so it's certainly possible if you want to uh, continue to use it before that's that's doable. Um, there's a question here about. Uh, let me just bring it up. Can multiple people edit the same terrain at the same time? And uh, I'm actually going to get Earl to help me on this one. I think the answer in 20.1, the July, uh, the August release is no, but we're working on that for the end of the year. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's right. So, uh, however, if someone is working on a, on a train and they commit it to the world server in a battle space, another person can connect to that battle space, see it, and uh, continue modifying it, uh, just not uh, at the same time right now. Right, but we do plan to support like real-time collaborative editing before the end of the year. We think that's going to be really a huge time saver. You know, you have 10 soldiers who aren't doing anything else. You import a GeoTIFF and you get, you know, roads and buildings and everything getting created by hand if that's if that's what you what you want to do. All right. So the next question is for Earl. Uh, okay, so how does Geo determine the building height and roof type from the shapefile? Um, so if that 
I think the simple answer is it doesn't. It has its own routines for how it's going to style a building, and it's really just using the the two D information there. Um, height information that's present will be used, um, and and certain elements that are there can be used. But it basically flows into that that data processing system that we talked about yesterday on the world server, where we already have a bunch of rules set up for what a building should look like in a certain part of the world, how tall it should be based on how close it is to a population center, um, what kind of roof shape it should have, and that's it's sort of, it's sort of an automated best guess. Righto. And the next question, is it possible to use Geo while offline? I think I might have answered that. You can use Geo offline, disconnected from the world server, uh, but you can't do any of the source file import. So you can still modify the terrain, you know, because effectively what you're doing is in VBS4, you have a base terrain layer that VBS Geo is then modifying. And when you save a battle space in VBS4, it's saving the changes that you've made to the baseline terrain in the Geo package format. So yes, you can do that uh, entirely offline. Uh, and within VBS4, there's workflows for then reconnecting to the world server later on and uploading your battle space to the world server. And so we're actually gonna be releasing a, a series of, of kind of short how-to videos over the next couple of weeks Kind of describing how this works we think it's pretty easy to use uh so yeah geo is fully supported offline offline being defined as disconnected from the uh the world server uh, we answered the question about terra tools being required from vbs3 to vbs4 you do not need terra tools for that uh the next one is i think we already answered with regards to collaborative terrain editing so oh, we'll skip that uh, there's a question here about uh about putting an ocean in the middle of the desert uh, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of, a, of a, tricky, a tricky one because the only thing you really can't do in VBS Geo in the 20.1 release in August is do water editing. We are working as quickly as possible to get water edi editing into VBS Geo. So you could go into the middle of a desert in Arizona or anywhere else and draw a big lake and have that lake fill, filled with water. So that, that is going to be uh, a capability that we offer later uh, in the year. Uh, in the meantime, Earl, is there any way to get that done? Is so Terra Tools, yeah. So um, yeah, if you have Terra Tools, uh, we do have a way to do that editing. So you can add and remove polygons uh, that affect water in, in the VBS4 system. Yeah, so if you're in a hurry, you need to use VBS Geo or you'll wait to the 20.2 release, which is scheduled, um, I think, for December, uh, which will have that capability in VBS Geo. Uh, so this is an interesting question about where VBS Geo terrain modifications are saved. And we did speak about this yesterday in some detail, uh, I, I guess, just to kind of recap. Basically, all terrain edits that are made in VBS Geo are saved in a separate Geo package file. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that actually applies to the terrain data you import, uh, but I, I think the answer is yes. I'm saying the right thing on IO. Yeah, that's what I thought. So uh, the point is that your battle space in VBS4 contains your terrain edits. And when you load a battle space or any administrator uh, on a computer that's connected to a world server loads a battle space, effectively all connected clients uh, see those changes immediately. So if I've got a trench in my battle space, the administrator loads that battle space, I will see the trench on all of my VBS4 clients. Uh, we are building the ability for you to be able to bake those terrain changes into the base terrain layer, and that will be available at the end of the year in the 20.2 VBS4 release. Um, so at the moment, there's really a single base terrain, and then you load the changes that you need to load. End of the year, you'll be able to bake the changes that you like into the base terrain. Uh, and then we are working on an approach for versioning as well. Uh, and you'll see that in the new year. Uh, okay, getting back into the terrain stuff now. Yeah, so this is an interesting one, Earl, that I think, uh, I don't know if you can tackle, or we might need one of the engine developers to tackle with regards to performance uh, and, and figuring out how performant your scene is. Sure. So. Um... I guess the information is there's probably no easy way to get that information right now, but we have the way that you saw the library there. There's there's other things that um, I think need will be added over time, like the scale information. So you could see when I was in the um, the power line section, just knowing how tall everything is uh, before you place it. Um, so that uh, that catalog is probably something that will be improved. And um, but I think actually to answer your question a different way, um, as I place all those oil barrels, we're using uh, instancing, so I can place uh, hundreds, if not thousands, or or maybe 
hundreds of thousands of those barrels and it wouldn't uh, be a problem for VBS4. All the trees are being placed in that same way. Those are regular tree models that I can place from Geo, but they're being placed by the biome and it's taking care of, of rendering the correct LOD at the correct distance. Um, and by instancing, if we're placing the same object many times, uh, that can be done really efficiently. So um, uh, obviously it should be a concern to, to not uh, cause any performance issues with the train that you're building. Um, but I think the, the rendering system is pretty efficient that uh, hopefully it's not something we need to worry about uh, a lot. Yeah, and there are profiling capabilities within VBS4 as well. I'm not sure how many are documented. Uh, but um, yeah, we can we can definitely work with you on that if it's important to you. Um, it's safe to say we aim to achieve 60 frames per second in VBS4 at all times uh, on the recommended hardware, uh, which I spoke about at the tech conference. Uh, and but obviously, if you're in control of your scene, then um, you know it, it's really up, up to you. So um, I'm afraid we can't answer the question perfectly, but uh, there are tools to help you with that. Uh, so surface classification um, made using material map. I mean, I understand that this is probably related to the Fort Carson terrain, and I think it was created using material map. Is that right? Yeah. So so material map can can feed geo directly. So if you have material map and geo, you can build a, a surface classification map that that geo can import. And I mean, the other way to get this type of data is from your GIS agencies. So you know, if you're in Battle Simulation Center, I'm sure you can re request these types of data products. Uh, and then you can import them yourself uh, using using VBS Geo. And, and I should add, Material Map is a add-on for pair of tools. Is that correct, Earl? That allows you to quickly classify surface data based upon the image. Yeah, it, it's standalone, and it's it's sort of a um, it's a desktop version of what Lex Carter just explained that they're doing. So they're doing you know large scale in the cloud uh, surface classification from imagery. Material Map is a desktop tool for doing that on uh, on imagery on, on your desktop. Roger. Uh, and there's a question here about formats that can be used um, to import geodata through VBS Geo. Do you want to just list those off quickly? Um, yeah, so the, all of the raster data comes in as GeoTIFF. Uh, GeoTIFF is supported, and then uh, actually you've already uh, you've already answered the question. Yeah, sh shape data for the uh, for the shape files. So buildings and roads are in uh, Esri shape file format. Yeah. And I mean, I guess a question just that I would add. So if I download data from OSM, can I use that data? Uh, it will have to be in shapefile format, but yes, if you have uh, building footprints in in, uh, in the shapefile format, uh, that's what uh, Geo can import right now. Yeah, and I think it's worthwhile just talking about the base globe for a second. So the world server it will include all the world's buildings. Um, we are considering enabling download of just region-specific data in the future uh, as well if you don't need all uh, the world's buildings. Okay, so the next one. Yes, yeah, so this one is for you, Earl. Okay, so how are overlapping imagery data sets at multiple resolutions handled? Does one take priority over the other? Um, I, I think that's in reference to the geo importing, and I believe um, what it actually comes down to is if you have overlapping imagery in the same area, it's going to be based on file names, so an alphabetical sorting order for those for those layers, uh, and that's not nothing more um, complex than that. So I guess the point is that at the moment there isn't really a blending capability for imagery. Not not between the imagery layers currently that you're importing from Geo, right? Right. Uh, we answered this question live about uh, geotypical terrains from VBS3 to VBS4. They'll be wherever the coordinates are, uh, which means, yes, they could end up in the ocean somewhere if you get that wrong. Uh, but maybe like in Sarani, that's what you uh, would like to achieve. Right, so here's a question, uh, Earl, I'll get you to take it regarding the VBS3 extract. Okay, um, I might actually have to go back and find out the answer to that. I believe it actually extracts the state of the terrain when you have it loaded in VBS. So if you have uh, mission level changes, and uh, like elevation changes to the data, I believe that it's, it's reading the, the actual state of the terrain at that time. So um, if you do have mission level changes and you don't want them, you'd have to revert and remove the mission from the terrain, uh, because I, I think that's what actually gets exported. So um, Spencer, uh, Spencer's one of our moderators. Hey Spencer, if we could just get back to this person by email once we have the answer. I'm also curious myself. And for anybody wondering why we did it this way, like why don't we just kind of import a VBS3 PBO file or WRP file directly into VBS4? It's because we wanted to get around um, all of the issues with regards to binarized terrain, encrypted terrain. You know, if you can load terrain into VBS3, then you can port that terrain into VBS4. So um, I'm really happy with how the guys and girls have approached this. 
All right, uh, let's have a look. We've got a couple more here that we're just going to push through. Yeah, so there's a question here about duplicate entries in VWS or, or separate instances. Uh, I'm not sure, Earl, if you can answer this or if we would need to go back with um, to get one of the world server experts involved. Right, so I think, um, yeah, we might have to go back to get a little bit more info. But right now, if you, if you bring in an inset uh, to one world server, um, all of that data is together. If, you, if, if you're loading it from something like TerraTools, if you have the actual, uh, I guess, the files, uh, the source data file, or the optimized data files that are stored on the world server, um, currently the, the, those are all part of the baseline globe. And that overlapping issue that I mentioned is, is what will we'll manage to, um, it, it'll manage what's being drawn. Um, however, through uh, through battle spaces, if you're editing things in Geo, that does exist on a separate level, and that's where we can have some versioning between edits. Uh, and in the near future, we'll have um, a more complete versioning system for separating all the kinds of source data that you're bringing into your, your world server. Uh, but it's also, I guess, important to, to note that we can have multiple world servers that have different states on them, so you can load up one, one state versus another and keep them side by side. All right, so here's an interesting question about performance. Um, and we're actually planning a short video on this uh, for release in the next couple of weeks that actually does give you some stats for, for example, Serrani and VBS3 on VBS3 recommended hardware versus Serrani and VBS4 on VBS4 recommended hardware. Um, from what we're seeing, we're seeing better performance. Uh, I can't give you the exact percentage right now, um, but please keep an eye out, our eye out for that video uh, on our channel. Um, we're actually intending to do a little video about how uh, the VBS3 extract works and, and then have a look at some of the performance on a couple of different VBS, uh, VBS3 terrains. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a common question. Obviously, everybody wants to reuse what they already have, um, and we want to make sure it runs uh, at, least, at least as well. Uh, so we've answered the, the Territorial Airfield generation question, um, and I would just reiterate when it comes to airfields, uh, we are aiming to populate the entire uh, world's airports by the end of the year on the world server with lighting and hopefully with uh, signs and also uh, surrounding buildings. Uh, a good question here about airfield configurations. And so a key point that I would just, um, before I hand over to Earl to ask about the AI, right now in VBS Geo, you can't create an airfield. That's, that's, that's something you can't do in VBS Geo right now. You either need to use the airfield as it comes in uh, via the world server or use Territools to build the airfield. And my understanding, Earl, is that you do get the AI configurations by default if you use Territools. Is that correct? That's right, yeah. So if you if you build an airfield in Territools, we're already uh, providing the, the VBS3 style airfield uh, information for, for those. Roger. Uh, so here's a good question with regards to con uh, uh, concurrency or um, keeping the world data current. Um, now, just one, one uh, point to note is that we actually don't provide whole Earth imagery with VBS4 or the VBS World Server. What you're actually seeing there on the globe is uh, our procedural imagery. So from, from various, we've obviously got the surface types defined for the entire planet, so we're kind of faking uh, imagery so it looks good from altitude or from space. So um, you would need to add your own imagery, uh, which is very easy to do, as we have, have shown you uh, into, into VBS4 of the world server. Um, but it's a good question, Earl, about how we are going to uh, keep, for example, the OpenStreetMap data updated, uh, or, or how would our customers do that if they had a world server? Yeah, so I, I guess the, the exact answer to that isn't defined yet. We're still discussing how that's going to work. Uh, we certainly have the tools to do it, um, and we're, we are constantly collecting more global data and, and bringing it into our data system. Uh, that, you know, there's going to be a particular state of the world in, uh, in the 20.1 release. Um, and over time, obviously, there are changes uh, that are going to be happening to the data. We're going to be continuing to collect that, and we have the ability to keep building and updating that. So um, I think it really goes probably to a more commercial answer, Pete. And I don't have an answer. Okay. <laughs> I'm a terrible chief commercial officer. Uh, we'll figure it out and, and let everybody know. Obviously, it's a key, a key point. Um, so there's a question here. It's a good question with regards to modifying, for example, the generic uh, region-specific house textures. Uh, is TerraTools needed, or can we do it through Geo? My understanding is that this is defined in various XML files, uh, and the data is accessible, but we haven't documented it yet. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's it's similar to the the biome discussion yesterday. Um, the the tools for editing editing that aren't complete yet. Um, they will be released at some point, so that you can edit all of the biome results. Um, 
and in the 20.1 release, um, there just aren't tools to, to dig in and, and manage all of that data. Well done. And the next question about large areas in VBS Geo. Um, we've answered this. We don't have a hard one to find uh, in VBS in VBS Geo. Uh, it should tackle whatever data you throw at it. Um, subject to Let's see how it goes, I guess. Uh, but, but in reality, it just means time in front of the computer, waiting for uh, the data to process. A question here about the trunk surface being a tin or a regular grid. My understanding all is that it's a grid, and then we can place ground cutting objects if you need to go on the ground. Is that correct? Yes, and um, it, it's a regular grid, but it can be very, very high resolution, down to a uh, sub centimeter, I think. And I believe that's how the Serrani terrain was done, even though um, so, so even though it's a different. Uh, projection system, we were able to correlate exactly to the Serrani VBS3 uh, flat earth terrain in VBS4 by having just very high resolution terrain, which runs very well. So as you get closer and closer, there's more detail. As you fade away, the LODs take care of showing you what you need to see at any at any point. We're just going to take a couple more questions and we'll wrap up. We're already six minutes over time. So uh, the next one is, uh, is there a file size cap in VBS4? I'm not sure if this is referring to 3D model content or um, if it's really well, I think I think the answer is no. So in the, in the past with VBS three uh, on older versions, there was a cap of I think two gigabytes for PBOs. So we're not even using PBOs anymore. First of all, we're using a, a smarter database type system, SQ lights, um, and uh, you know for example, there at one point the entire road system was stored in one file that was seventy two gigabytes. So I think the answer is no cap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, and we'll just go with a couple more questions here. Uh, yeah, it's a question about building textures and, and how, how we're actually defining defining that. My understanding is it's as per OSM, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so it's it's as what's available in OSM when it's available, and when it isn't, we use a, a kind of a, a coarse population map or a city center um, layer that tells us if buildings should be tall near a city center, and then. In addition to that, if you um, think about the way we did biome trees, where different trees um, appear in different parts of the world, there's different uh, styles for different cities in the world. So for example, Prague has almost no high-rise buildings. So even in the very city center there, there's no tall buildings. Um, and that's in the, the sort of baseline global terrain. What I actually showed today was using Terra tools, where we can, we can sort of mimic that exact same process, or we can take more direct control and, and do different things. In, in the case of what I showed, I had my own script that was just doing a, a, com a completely random uh, number of floors per building uh, that had some awareness of the city center. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, a question about bathymetry and underwater depths. And we actually showed that yesterday. We fully support um, uh, bathymetry and, uh, and underwater environments as well. Yeah, so yep. I'll just ask Spencer to add the, I think he can add the link in and everyone can see it if he puts it into the chat from uh, yesterday's session. Uh, towards the end, we had a, a kind of a detailed look at high resolution bathymetry. Yeah, that'd be great, Spencer, if actually you could do that before everybody logs off, just so everybody has a direct link to the session yesterday. Uh, the question about inclusion of military airfields, we don't know. <laughs> at this stage, um, it will include at least all of the world's commercial airports. Uh, and then through Territools, we're expecting you could build additional airports relatively easily if, if you need them. Uh, and I think that's where we will leave it. Um, there is a, another question about how many VBS4 clients can connect to a single world server, um, and you know, we don't know yet. Uh, we're still we're still testing testing that now. We're hoping to at least serve an entire battle simulation center um, from a single world server, uh, but it really does depend on the data that you are streaming across the network. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there. Um, thank you so much, Earl. Thank you, Colin. Uh, thank you to everybody who attended. Really, um, really interesting information. And uh, like I said, we're going to do the same session again this afternoon. The Brycon will be included. And please check YouTube uh, for that if uh, if you can't make the session this afternoon. All right, thank you very much. Have a, have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.